If you will, and I hope you will, take your Bibles, and you're going to want to find the New Testament book of Hebrews today. Hebrews chapter 13, if you will. I'll meet you there in a moment. Ancient map makers, before they had any of the modern instruments that they have today, would draw maps as far out as they had explored. And when they reached the furthest point of their exploration, and they did not know what lay beyond that point, they would often write on that map, beyond here be dragons. Now, it was not that they had seen any dragons, but it was simply this. They didn't know what lay beyond where they had been. And so it served as kind of a warning, and it was kind of a superstition uh, that there may be fearful things out beyond this point. Be aware, there may be fearful things. Uh, mankind, and you, you can attest to this, mankind has always had a fear of the unknown, a fear of what the future might hold. I don't know if you know this or not, but every, every year about this time, there is a huge surge in the business of psychics and mediums and palm readers. This is for real. Business, this is a great time of year for them because people always want to know what's out there. They live in fear. They want to know what's going on out there. And listen, I'll say this about palm readers. You really have to hand it to them. <laughs> a, lady, a lady went to a tarot reader, you know, wanting to have her future predicted. And the lady started laying out all of those cards and she got a very serious look on her face. And she said, ma'am, I have to tell you, your, uh, your husband is going to die a violent death in the near future. She said, don't tell me things I already know. Tell me if I'm getting away with it. Uh, <laughs> now, I, I don't know your mother, but chances are she was a card reader. Mine was. I can tell you what's going to happen to you when your dad gets home based on that report card, Frank. <laughs> a young woman goes to see a fortune teller who tells her, there's two men that are madly in love with you. Excitedly, the woman asked, well, who will be the lucky one? She said, the fortune teller, Mark's going to marry you. Bob will be the lucky one. <laughs> Sometimes you don't really want to know maybe what the future holds, right? Listen, we're standing on the threshold of a, of a new year. None of us have any idea what 2023 has in store. What is going to bring our way, not, a, not as a planet, not as a nation, certainly not as individuals. We simply don't know if there be dragons beyond here, right? The uncharted days ahead, we, we, we just don't know. But I want to just encourage you today, uh, after finishing a two-year study of Revelation a few years ago, I'm pleased to remind you, our Lord Jesus is the ultimate dragon slayer. Amen? That dragon will be cast into a pit. Read the book of Revelation. You've heard the old adage, we don't need to worry about what the future holds if we know what? Who holds the future, right? Now, it's certainly not our Lord's desire that we face with fear the uncertainty of the days in which we live. Jesus was often heard saying, don't worry, don't fret, don't fear, right? Uh, don't be anxious. Just over and over, Jesus told the people that listened to him, don't live in fear. Now, with that in mind, I want us to look at Hebrews chapter 13, just a couple of verses this morning. If you're looking there at your Bibles, let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have, for he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper I will not fear. What can man do to me? Now, in these two verses, I want to just give you about four thoughts for us to apply our hearts to as we face the uncertainty of the new year. 
The first thing, if you're taking notes, write down, be content with God's provision. Be content with God's provision. That's verse 5. Let your conduct, it means your lifestyle, your living, the way you live, live without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. Someone once described contentment this way. Quote, discontentment is a disease and it takes away our joy and it takes away your peace. Contentment is not getting what you want, but is wanting what you already have. Contentment will make a poor man rich and discontentment makes a poor man poorer. End quote. I mean, no matter how much you have, if you're discontented, you're really poor. Sometimes we want things we don't need. Sometimes we think we need things that we really don't need, right? There was a parable called the parable of the tears. Perhaps you've heard this parable. Two teardrops met along the river of life. Said one tear to the other tear, where did you come from? The second tear said, I'm the tear of a girl who loved a man and lost him. And where do you come from? And the first tear replied, I'm the tear of the woman who found him and married him. <laughs> Many times we think we need something we really don't. We get our luxuries and our necessities confused, right? Are you with me? We've all been there. I love the story of a New York businessman. He travels all the way to, to Hollywood in his brand new Porsche and he parks it in front of this office complex wanting to show it off to his prospective new clients. And as he's getting out of the car, uh, a garbage truck comes blowing by and just rips the door right off of the Porsche. The man is distraught. He grabs his mobile phone. He calls the police. And about five minutes later, the police arrive. But before the policeman even has a chance to ask any questions, the man just starts screaming hysterically, my Porsche, my beautiful silver Porsche is ruined. Well, the officer notices the New York license plate and he just begins to shake his head in disgust. He says, I just can't believe how materialistic you New York people are. You're so focused on your possessions you, that you don't even notice anything else in your life. And the man is, and is sobbing, and he says, how can you say something like that at a time like this? The policeman says, don't you realize that your left arm was torn off when the door was torn off? And the guy goes, oh, man, my Rolex. <laughs> Be content, right? Be content with such things as you have. Paul writes this in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. You're rich today. If you know the Lord, you can be content. Amen? He goes on to say this, For we brought nothing into this world. You know this verse. And it's certain we can what? Carry nothing out. When I read that verse, I always think of my, one of my favorite authors, Vance Havner. He said, I've done a lot of funerals over the years. I've never seen a hearse pulling a U-Haul. If you've got something on your back and something to eat and you have Jesus Christ in your heart, folks, you're blessed. You're blessed. Material things can never bring contentment. And the reason they can't bring contentment is because material things cannot satisfy the deepest needs of the human heart. That's the reason Ecclesiastes 5.10 says this, He who loves silver will not be satisfied with silver, nor he who loves abundance with increase, this also is vanity. Either you can't get enough of it, or when you get it, you find out it still does not meet your needs. I heard the story of a young boy who absolutely loved pancakes. On his birthday, his mother decided he's gonna, she's going to give him all the pan, pancakes his heart can desire. And so he comes down there, and she begins to put pancakes, and he just relishes every bite. She just keeps bringing him pancakes, one after the other, more, another stack. And he keeps putting them away, and finally she asks him, Sweetheart, do you want another pancake? And he just barely can talk, and he says, Mom, I don't even want the ones I've already eaten. <laughs> That's the way it is with silver. He that loves silver will never be satisfied with silver. 
You know why material things can't bring contentment? Jesus said this in Luke 12, 15. He said this, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life does not consist in the abundance of the things that he possesses. Your deepest needs will never be met by material things, right? Nothing, listen, nothing wrong with material things. They just cannot satisfy the deepest longings of your heart. Do you know why we often have fear? We have fear because sometimes we think our needs are not going to be met. Or, or, or because we think that the things we think are meeting our needs are, are going to be taken away from us. You guys, most of you here, you remember you didn't live through the, the 1920s. But you know what happened in 1929 and 30 when the stock market crashed. People were jumping out of high-rise buildings. So many of them, it was horrible. We've all heard stories of those things. What you, why they did that was because they lost, they lost things that they were trying to satisfy their hearts with, right? That's where their security was. Folks, I'm going to tell you something today. We will have less fear if we have our security and our sufficiency and our satisfaction in something that can't be tampered with. Set your treasures in heaven where moth and rust don't corrupt, where thieves don't break through and steal, Right? If we want to face a new year without fear of whatever dragons be out there, we need to just learn to be content with what God has already provided us. Let your conduct be without covetousness and, the, and be content with such things as you have. Secondly, write this down. Trust the companionship of God's presence. Trust the companionship of of God's presence. Again, verse 5, let your conversation or yet your conduct be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Now listen, you need to trust the companionship of Jesus' presence in your life, right? Amen? This, this promise here, I will never leave you nor forsake you. It's the same promise that you find in Matthew 28, except it's stated, one is stated in the negative, one is stated in the positive. Jesus said in Matthew 28, 20, and lo, I am with you how, for how long? Always, even to the end of the age. Now, that's the positive way of saying it. The negative way of saying it, I will never leave you nor forsake you. It says the exact same thing. Listen, I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to face next year. But there's one thing I do know. Folks, Jesus will never leave me. Jesus will never forsake me. Jesus is always with me, even to the end of the age. And I, listen, I can, I can trust that He will abide in me. Even when Frank gets sinful... He does not leave me. He's with me always, even to the end of the age. This, folks, that may just be among the most encouraging verses in the Bible. Some people fear because they're afraid they're going to have to face something they don't understand, and they're going to have to, 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 to go through it and face it alone. No. You're not going to have to face it alone. Greek scholars tell us that the sentence, I will never leave you nor forsake you. In the Greek, it actually contains five negatives. In the original language, it's five negatives. Now listen, you know, if you know anything about English, double negatives are considered in the English language to not be right, right? We're not supposed to use double negatives, so I, I won't not use no double negatives in this sermon. However, evidently, it wasn't bad when you used them in Greek. Here's what scholars tell us that it literally says in the Greek text, according to scholars, it says this, I will never, no, not ever, no, never leave nor forsake you. <laughs> Can't nail it down any tighter than that, right? There's the trust, the companionship of His presence. I mean, look at those words. Never leave nor forsake. What it literally means is, I will never abandon you. It means I will not give up on you. Aren't you glad God doesn't give up on you? 
boy, I tell you what, some days, well, it's just best, it's just best you're not around me 24-7. Now, I'm going to tell a little story on our friend. <laughs> Went over to pick up a dresser, Renee's house, the other day, me and, me and my brother Jeff back there. She gave us a dresser. We're giving it to our grandson. We're going down the stairs of her upstairs apartment, and I'm holding the top, and uh, in other words, I got the dumb end. Jeff got the smart end. He's holding the base of the dress. I got the top. And the whole top just rips off. And the thing drops down and just shaves skin right off my shins. Now, your witness, I never said a word. But if I would have spit on something, the paint would have peeled. I'm telling you, it was bad what I was thinking of. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad that the Lord knows my heart. That, that was painful. You know, you, you know how it is when you take something and just rip the skin right off your shins. And you go, I'm a, I said something like, well, I'm glad you're here because I'm a pastor and I'd hate to say something I don't want to say. The Lord knows my heart. I'm not always that victorious. That shocks you, right? Listen, he promises never to leave me. He never gives up on me. Even when I get foolish and sinful and say things and do things I don't want to do, like the Apostle Paul, the things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, I find myself doing. That happens to all of us. And you know what? In the midst of all of that, he never leaves you. He never forsakes you, right? He never leaves us like a helpless orphan. I'm speaking to some of you today because I know some of you have gone through the loss of a loved one. And you're facing days and you've just went through the holidays Without that person here. Some of you have lost children. You've, relationships have dissolved. A job ended. All of a sudden you're finding what? What am I going to do? This, this, I'm facing some dragons. I want to encourage you today. Whatever you're facing, God will never leave you nor forsake you. Right? Listen. What does it mean to, to me to face this new year? Folks, when, I'm, when I get discouraged... I, I know he's going to see me through. I know he will. The psalmist writes this in Psalm 116, verse 8. Man, you may, might want to write this one down. For you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. When I'm discouraged, his presence sees me through. When I'm lonely, his presence can cheer me up. When I'm worried... His presence just calms me down. He doesn't go, Frank, I am so sick and tired of you worrying and not trusting me. I'm going to leave you alone. No, it never does that. All of us worry, right? What? Am I the only one? No, every one of us here battles at times with worry. Someone once mentioned, and it kind of stuck with me, they said this, quote, worry is a mild form of atheism. It's acting like God doesn't exist, end quote. Ouch. I'm reminded uh, of a story I read this on. I uh, read something about the life of uh, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, great Bible expositor from the mid-1800s, man used greatly by God uh, in London. Charles Haddon Spurgeon was given to great times of discouragement and depression. Uh, and after a prolonged time of despondency over his ministry, his wife came in to the room where he was at wearing a black dress that was reserved exclusively for funerals. And Spurgeon asked whose funeral she was going to, and she told him that God had died and she was going to his funeral. Spurgeon began to reprimand her for such heresy. And then she told her husband that judging from the way he had been acting and moping around, she figured God had died. Charles Spurgeon got the message. Sometimes we, we live like God's really not in control. That he really doesn't have my life in the palm of his hand and nobody's ever able to pluck me out of his hand. We don't live that way, though we know those verses, Right? We get all worried and fretful. This is what he's saying. I will never leave you nor forsake you. So be content with God's provision, but also trust in the companionship of his presence, right? Can I give you another one? 
Have confidence in His promise. We're still in verse 5. I just want to point this out briefly. Let your conversation or your conduct be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For, and underline this, for He has said. This is coming right from the Lord Himself. For He has said this. I will never leave you or forsake you. Underscore that phrase. He has said this. This is confidence... In the promise. And folks, as you well know, a promise is no better than the one who makes it. Right? Again, scholars say in the Greek, what that literally says is, He Himself has said. Who is it that says, I will never leave you or forsake you? It's the all-powerful, all-knowing, ever-present God. This is the confidence we can have in His promise, because He Himself said it. This is not a second-hand promise. He Himself says, I will never abandon you. When I say, Lord, beyond here, there may be dragons. It's uncharted territory this year. I don't know where it's going to lead. I don't know what's going to happen in the world. I don't know what's going to happen in the United States. I don't know what's going to happen in my life. And He says, I'll never leave you or forsake you. What does it matter? What does it matter? Folks, there's contentment in His provision. Be content with such things as you have. There's companionship in His presence. Ah, He will never leave you or forsake you. And there's the confidence of His promise because He Himself has said this. This is the promise from the Word of God. Beyond here, there may be dragons. But we can go, listen, we can go into the new year with the confidence of His promise that... Fear not what the future holds, because we trust the one who holds the future. Can I get a resounding amen out of that? Amen. Amen. So be content with God's provision. Trust in the companionship of His presence. And have confidence in God's promise. And fourthly, rest in the comfort of God's protection. Look at verse 6. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear what man shall do unto me. And I want you to put something together. In verse 5, for he has said, verse 6, that we may boldly say. He has said, that's the reason I can boldly say. You see, he's telling you to apply that. Because he has said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. Then I can boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I I will not fear any dragons, whoever or whatever they may be. That's a great encouragement, folks. When you face a new year without fear, whatever dragons, as it were, may await your life, find your contentment in Jesus Christ. He truly is enough. Amen? He's truly enough. Only Jesus. I love that old song. Colleen McCann, our pastor's wife, back in the 80s, saying, only Jesus can satisfy the soul. He truly can. Find your contentment in Christ. Find your companionship in Christ. Find your confidence in Christ. And when you do that, you'll find your comfort in Christ as well. That's how we can boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I'm not going to fear what dragons are out there. It doesn't matter what man can do to me. Now, folks, without a doubt, there are going to be some dragons beyond 2023. The Bible tells us in in the book of Job, I think it was Eliphaz, one of Job's so-called comforters, he pointed out this. He said, a man is born to trouble just as surely as the sparks from a fire float upward. He's just saying... It's inevitable. There are going to be hardships. There are going to be dangers. There are going to be things that will try to overcome you with worry and doubt, and you will fear if you're not careful. Draw back on these promises. There's going to be health issues. I got a call from a good friend of mine yesterday. They found like eight polyps up inside him. And I've been witnessing to this man and talking to him and He is very open to that today. He called to let me know. I want him to come to Christ. 
He's facing a dragon. He's facing the unknown. But what he's really facing is an eternity without Jesus. If he doesn't come to Christ. There's going to be health issues. Family issues. Financial issues. Economic. Political issues. They're going to come. We're, I've read the end of the story. I know, it's, I know where this world is going, don't you? You've read the book. There is a person in the book of Revelation referred to as the dragon. Read the book of Revelation and find out what happens to that old dragon. Watch who takes care of him and puts him away forever. What he's going to do to the dragon he will take care of those dragons that we face. Amen? You don't, have to, you don't have to face... You may have to face some on occasions, yeah. But you can stand on the promises of the Word of God and say boldly, the Lord is my helper. I don't fear what man can do to me. Those to whom this was written... They were undergoing a lot of opposition. You want to read it in its context. There's family and friends and foes alike were, were giving them a hard time because of their, their faith in Jesus Christ. They were facing mockery. They were facing brutality. They were facing robbery. And yet the writer of Hebrews says, look, you can boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. And then I hope you'll say that. The Lord is my helper. By the grace of God, I will not fear what this year holds. Because you never know what it holds. None of us know what we're going to go through this coming year. We don't know what dragons there be beyond here. But what we do know is we can boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I'm not going to fear what man can do to me. Now for the big question, what is it? So what? What? So what? What, what? what are we going to do? Let me just suggest three things. They all begin with the letter L. Help you to remember them. First of all, learn contentment in Jesus. Learn contentment in Jesus. Paul said this in Philippians 4, Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. It's not going to come naturally to us. Contentment is something we have to learn because our, our sinful nature, it wants more. And Paul said, I've had, to, I've had to learn this no matter what I've gone through. I have learned to be content no matter what. And you know why? Because a few verses later he will say why. It's because my God, verse 19, shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So learn Learn contentment in Christ. Number two, lean on your companionship with Jesus. Jesus said this in John 14, 6. I am going to pray the Father and He will give you another helper. And look at this. And He will abide with you how long? Sounds familiar, doesn't it? We keep getting told. It's forever. It's not temporary. The new, the, the another helper will abide with us forever. Learn to lean on the companionship you have with Jesus. Leaning upon the everlasting arms, as the old hymn says. Number three, live confidently in Jesus. The Apostle Paul said this in 2 Timothy 1.12, For this reason I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, and I love this line, For I know in whom I believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. There is a man who lived confidently in Christ. It doesn't matter what I suffer, no matter what I go through. I know this, the Lord is will keep that which I've committed to him against that day. I am his to the very end, right? Folks, if you do these things, if you learn to be content and you lean on the companionship, walking in the Spirit, listening to the Holy Spirit, he is your helper, he's your guide. Lean on him. You can live confidently in Jesus. When you do that, 
I believe you're going to find your comfort and your courage in Jesus. Whatever dragons there may be beyond here in 2023, listen to it one more time. Let your conduct, let your conversation be without covetous. Be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave you or forsake you, that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man can do to me. Amen? Amen. Thank you for the encouragement of your word, Father. Thank you, Lord, for meeting our needs every single time. Forgive us when we doubt. Forgive us when we have bouts of discouragement as though you had given up on us, as though you were not walking with us. Lord, we want to live joyful, victorious lives in Christ. So help us, Lord, to apply this message from Hebrews today to our hearts. As we face whatever happens in 2023, it is you who has made the day, so we will rejoice and be glad in it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. May the Lord bless you. Remember to come back this evening for prayer, for a time of uh, saying our so-longs to Chad. Hope you will come back. God bless you.